Numerous flags exist that may alter outcomes for rehab. Failure to acknowledge or investigate these flags may adversely affect intervention. Before getting started with our discussion on intervention and treatment, let's consider some key concepts. One of the most important jobs that we have as a physical therapist in our examination is to rule out uh, non-mechanical or systemic origins of pain. We want to make sure that the patient is in our care and we can take care of them and they don't need to be referred to a medical practitioner. We're looking for red flags. We're also trying to determine if there might be neurologic signs or symptoms that might affect how we treat that patient. We're also looking at psychological issues that may affect the patient presentation yellow flags or differences in their behavior. We're going to look more uh, closely at Waddell's behavioral signs a little bit later in our patient examination. Basically it's really important to determine if that patient has anything that could be uh, creating problems that is not appropriate for physical therapy. Gordon Waddell, an orthopedic surgeon, made some important contributions to physical therapy and really within the treatment of uh, spinal pain sufferers uh, worldwide. He came up with some behavioral signs. Now what these were really trying to do is trying to look at the cause of back pain and try to determine if these were indeed mechanical problems. You see the eight different items above if we have essentially three or more of the above findings then we can possibly assume that this problem is non-mechanical in nature. Now the person that may be uh, eliciting these symptoms or these behavioral signs uh, might be out for secondary gain. They might not wish to be working or they may feel that they need to demonstrate some sort of disability. Sometimes we see this in workers' comp patients and sometimes within the military. Uh, but we'd like to believe that most of our patients are indeed genuine about their pain. Unfortunately, we have to use some behavioral signs like this to determine if they're not. First of all, overreaction. Inappropriate overreaction, that is. Uh, somebody that might say that their back is killing them and having an exaggerated emotional response, possibly jumping off a table, uh, might be somebody that demonstrates an overreaction to your examination. Simulated axial compression. Now what this is, is giving gentle compression through the head shouldn't cause back pain because you're not giving enough force. But if a person that seemingly has symptoms with this simulated compression is probably demonstrating a behavioral sign. Simulated rotation is similar. So having a patient stand with their feet firmly planted and then rotating the entire body essentially not rotating the spine, maybe initiating at the hips, and if that person has uh, symptoms or reports symptoms with this, they may be demonstrating an abnormal behavioral sign. Regional sensory disturbance. This is when a person doesn't really display any specific dermatomal or myotomal pattern. So let's say if the arm that they're complaining of is completely numb, this doesn't necessarily respond to specific nerve root problems they would be said to have a regional sensory disturbance. A distracted straight leg raise, or SLR. Now, sometimes when you test a patient, let's say several physicians have maybe performed a straight leg raise in the supine position, if the patient knows that you're testing a specific nerve, they may only let you lift their leg a small amount. So a way to distract the patient to determine if they have the same amount of straight leg raise is to do it with a patient sitting on the edge of the bed or a chair and then extending their knee. If they can extend their knee fully, that's essentially almost a 90 degree straight leg raise and therefore they would be positive for displaying a distracted straight leg raise. Manual muscle testing. This is important as well. If somebody has a cogwheel type resistance to manual muscle testing, this is definitely abnormal and not indicative of any specific musculoskeletal or neurologic problem. This demonstrates the sincerity of effort may not be all there. If tenderness is non-anatomic when you're palpating landmarks, if it makes no specific sense, or if somebody has very much superficial tenderness to palpation, this may be considered to be a Waddell behavioral sign. Also, if you're seeing several of these, you know that something might not be quite right. This person may have some psychosocial issues going on that affects treatment. 
Clinical prediction rules can be useful to clinicians to identify patients with low back pain who are appropriate candidates for manipulation intervention. In this clinical prediction rule for spinal manipulation, the criterion factors of duration of symptoms, location of distal symptoms, the fear avoidance belief questionnaire, which is an index which measures exaggerated pain perception developed by Waddell, segmental mobility, and hip internal rotation are used. The use of a clinical prediction rule should improve selection of an appropriate intervention. However, care must be taken to make certain that your specific patient matches the characteristics for the population that the clinical prediction rule was developed on. Research shortcomings for clinical prediction rules have been that the sample sizes are small and that there may be design flaws. In addition, as we saw in the spinal manipulation clinical prediction rule, hip internal rotation was in the criterion. So this suggests that the role of the hips should not be overlooked. Correlations have also been shown with the low back when you're looking at the mechanical relationships of hip tightness and core stability. Now with these key concepts in mind, let's start to examine some interventions related to the previously selected lumbar conditions. Let's start first with the lumbar disc condition. For the lumbar disc, protrusion of the disc is a prediscal state. Education is key to address the fact that the disc may progress. Extension principles are the first aid to help with reducing the protrusion. Interventions depend on the stage of the condition and response of the system, symptoms, whether they are centralizing or proliferizing. Traction, whether mechanical or positional, is a method to attempt to unload the disc. We will discuss positional traction in more detail in the next slide. For manipulation, if there are positive neurological signs, such as decreased deep tendon reflexes, decreased sensation, decreased motor responses, this is undesirable to manipulate. You need to be worried of rotational forces because this may actually progress the injury. Cauda equina injuries, as we stated previously, is a red flag. This is out of the scope of PT. We can't fix this. This patient will need to be monitored by MD. Now let's look at positional traction. Positional distraction deserves some attention. This is a method that Dr. Stanley Paris used as an alternative to mechanical traction. Through a couple of his uh, clinical experiences, he had made a couple of patients much worse after a use of mechanical traction for their disc dysfunction. After mechanical traction, they found that these patients were in uh, much greater pain and could not get off the treatment table. Positional distraction, this particular movement, while pictured, would be for a left lateral disc bulge. Laying over the rolled pillow or a bolster on the right side, side bending over that bolster would open up the left side, particularly the intervertebral foramen. This would pull flat any disc protrusion and allow nerve pressure to be reduced and hopefully healthy circulation would be restored. Now if you suspect that there is an annular tear, you may need to wait before undergoing this treatment until the annulus can approximate and essentially heal before doing this. This is an inexpensive and convenient way to manage nerve root pressure and can give substantial relief. The patient can easily uh, accomplish this at home as well. For facet dysfunction intervention, focus needs to be on education for proper posture, body mechanics, relative rest, activity modification. Initially, the position of comfort will be emphasized, but it will be important for the person to learn proper position so not to re-aggravate and irritate it. Sometimes modalities will be used to decrease symptoms then manipulation and mobilizations may be attempted to decrease pain as well. 
Chunk and core strengthening are often beneficial, especially as the person learns to try to prevent reoccurrence. Usually, facet dysfunctions do not require surgical intervention. Treatment of ligamentous weakness and postural back pain really hinges on good management. Education is key. Helping a patient avoid positions that are detrimental to their condition is key. One tool that works very, very well in my practice is proprioceptive taping. You're really taping a person in a normal lordosis. What this does, this gives instant feedback to the person when they're actually coming out of a position that's desirable. Uh, one interesting component of people with ligamentous weakness and postural back pain, especially those with postural problems, uh, especially with sitting and forward bending, is that they don't feel that their current position is that detrimental. Often, they don't even realize that they're breaking into postures that are detrimental to them. So putting a low die tape or a low stretch tape on the lumbar spine and taping somebody into a desirable position can give them excellent feedback. Biofeedback is very important. What happens in these patients is they start losing postural awareness. The position that they're now in that's detrimental to their condition actually feels normal or maybe even good or desirable. The taping can provide somebody with a very good short learning curve to where they can actually get some feedback and start making appropriate corrections. Now stabilization and conditioning is also cornerstone. What we're looking for is endurance. We want type 1 muscles, long duration, low intensity exercise. It's kind of no frills treatment. It's no frills exercise. But it's done for endurance. It needs to be done just like you're training for running. The longer your back can hold you in a stable position, the longer it's going to protect you. And therefore, endurance is very important in treating this type of weakness and back pain. These are some movements that are typically done to help manage the early onset of strains, sprains, and synovitis. Just simple movements such as active, more pain-free range of motion and gentle stretching can accommodate a lengthening of the structure. This can reduce muscular tone and pain as well as encourage some better circulation into those areas. When an area is injured or swollen and it's difficult to assume normal positions, that may need to be slowly integrated back into a person's regimen. If a person is fixed in a forward flex position, the top two in the bottom left picture may be very useful in restoring a, a normal lumbar lordotic posture. This posture is optimal because it reduces the amount of stretch that's placed on the extensor muscles in the spine. It also reduces some swelling in the posterior disc and can relieve stress and strain and swelling in these fashions. What you're looking at in the lower right hand corner is a gentle rotation range of motion exercise. This is good at reducing pain and improving circulation into these areas uh, along with restoring uh, gentle range of motion in these areas. Recall for instability that it's an imbalance of three systems, the passive system, the neurological system, and the active systems. All these systems must be addressed. Stabilization exercises are important. Sometimes external supports are needed. Posture and ergonomic modification and education are essential. Balance is the key. Oftentimes, there, wherever there is a hypermobility, there may exist adjacent hypomobilities, so these need to be moved as well. It becomes very important that this person is well aware of what postures or what positions are aggravating for them and which ones are more positive for them to maintain or stay in. The transversus abdominis, or abbreviated TA, is a very important muscle uh, in terms of stability. It has an attachment to the thoracolumbar fascia, which will provide segmental stabilization, kind of like the multifidus. When it tightens, it really acts like a corset. It fires with the internal and external oblique, uh, informing this corset. It actually directly fires with the internal oblique. Now, the rectus abdominis, the ones that are fired with your crunches, they'll give you the six-pack look, but they really don't have much of an influence on spinal stability. 
you need to do a good transversus abdominis contraction, a small contraction, without recruiting the rectus abdominis and obliques, which is pretty hard to selectively fire. Sometimes the use of diagnostic ultrasound can aid in uh, getting a very good contraction of this area. Also, the little stabilizer pressure cuff is a good method of doing this as well. So you've got to think about the transversus abdominis for the back much like we think about the knee. We're going to work the hamstrings and quads to stabilize it. So the back really needs the same attention both to the anterior and the posterior musculature. So the abs are really just the front of the back if we think about it that way. Here is an example of a beginning stabilization exercise. Now it's extremely important that the exercises are done with the engagement of the core muscles and with absolutely perfect form. We say perfect practice. The first picture to the upper left hand corner is just a basic transversus abdominis draw in exercise. The focus of this exercise is drawing in the abdomen towards the spine. While it's drawn in, a person is encouraged to breathe normally while they're keeping that belly drawn in. The hands in the lower back is good to monitor the position of the spine. So as long as a person can be effective in this position, it can be moved on to the picture to the right or to the one on the bottom of the screen, where the person gets more unsupportive. Now that challenges the abdominal muscles to actually stabilize uh, with more instability. This is again done for endurance for a very long amount of time and without significant straining or an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. What you see here is a more standard means of firing the lumbar multifidus. This can be done also with a concurrent transversus abdominis draw-in. What you're seeing in the upper left hand corner is a basic exercise where the upper extremities and the trunk is supported on the table. The lower right hand corner is more of an unsupported position and more of a dynamic activity that requires more balance. This likely increases the activity of these trunk muscles and therefore taxes them a little bit more. When a patient gains strength and stability, these advancements should be used uh, to increase a patient's endurance and dynamic ability to stabilize. Finally, on to specific functional core training. This is probably the most rudimentary approach, and it's totally appropriate for very deconditioned patients, say with spinal stenosis or dynamic instability. What you're seeing the patient to the left do is essentially uh, create a transversus abdominis contraction, and she's likely monitoring uh, that contraction in the front of her abdomen. While she's doing that, she's also performing a functional squat, ensuring that she's able to keep the contraction throughout the squatted posture. This ensures that she's going to keep her protected position while she's performing the functional activity. To the right would be more of a functional lunge. Uh, this is done typically to reinforce functional movements that include walking or, say, stooping forward to pick something up with a more stable base of support. These are ways that you can definitely increase the stability, strength, and functional ability of the patient slowly but surely while not risking injury. Treatment in scoliosis is multifactorial. Generally, the goal of treatment is to prevent the progression of the curvature if it's mild. Correction or stabilization of a severe curve may be necessary. Non-operatively, exercises or braces are of choice. I've had excellent success with pain related to uh, lumbar spine and thoracic spinal pain in patients with scoliosis. So essentially, even if you're not treating scoliosis directly, you may be managing a patient with scoliosis and their movement patterns should be considered. Operatively, uh, such as uh, Procedures like rod stabilization uh, might be an important factor in preventing deformity later on in life. We're going to go through those more specifically. Compression fractures are usually classified as stable fractures and rarely associated with neurological compromise. Use of orthotics will depend on whether the patient is in severe pain despite a stable fracture. This patient may benefit from extension bracing, in addition, if a patient continues to have progression of their kyphosis, then treatment 
with long-term treatment with extension bracing for three months and monitoring of the curve progression would be warranted. Surgical intervention is only necessary if the curve progresses severely or there are breathing or bowel complications.